After the spread of the Indo-European bell beakers through Western Europe, there was a period from probably about 2200 BC to about 1700 BC where the majority of the population in Western and Central Europe possessed a common language, that being Indo-European, or perhaps we can postulate a West Indo-European dialect at this point. Though likely every tribal group had slight dialectical variations, there was a great deal of linguistic continuity. With distance and time, however, this began to break down. Concrete evidence of this continuity can be found in one of the strongest post-Beaker unique cultural groups, the Unitika culture. See the image for approximate location. Artifacts from the Unitika culture have been found in Ireland, and gold in artifacts attributed to this group, such as the Nebra Sky Disc, was found to have been mined in Cornwall. Thus, this period of the Bronze Age uh, shows a high degree of mobility and trade networks between various tribal groups and cultural groups who are all still speaking a mutually intelligible language and with similar customs and spiritual beliefs. However, even at this point, the stage is set for linguistic and cultural separation. To the southwest of the Unitika culture, situated along the Rhine and the Danube, was a growing and dynamic group referred to as the South German culture. They maintained networks and connections with other beaker groups, such as the barbed wire beakers in Gaul to their west and the Unitika to their east. It's likely within this group, as early as 1800 BC, that the first traces of an Italo-Celtic language began to develop from the West Indo-European. These developments likely would have also been spreading more broadly to other groupings that they were connected with, but by 1600 BC they likely culminated in a separate language grouping that was no longer easily understood by those who still spoke regional dialects of Western Indo-European. That grouping is likely Italo-Celtic. This was the rise of the so-called Tumulus culture. Although most Indo-European groups were not averse to war, the Tumulus culture seems to have been a specific warrior culture, where a small elite, through the class division of society, was able to dedicate itself to war. They are named for their distinctive large tumuli, which they would have created for their dead, akin to the Bronze Age tumuli in Britain, Ireland, and elsewhere in Europe during the Bronze Age. Now, if you would like to support independent research outside the agenda in modern academia, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon or through PayPal for a few dollars a month. It will really help to produce more content, higher quality content, and work towards the establishment of a sanctuary. Now to return to the Tumulus culture. These warrior bands, speaking a proto-Italo-Celtic language, began expanding territory rapidly through aggressive conquest and a mastery of metalsmithing. They begin expanding into Gaul, but they are also trading and influencing other Belvica groups, including the cultural group established in Britain and Ireland. These networks are also helping to shape the languages in these regions. At some point during the Tumulus culture, bands enter into Italy, bringing the parent of the Italo-Celtic languages with them, which would, in this specific location and context, go on to become Latin, Sabine, Oscan, Umbrian, etc. Those who remain north of the Etruscans, however, those in Central and Western Europe, move towards the Celtic spectrum. This period of the Tumulus culture and the Urnfield culture that emerged from it could be compared to the Greeks during their migration phase in the early Iron Age, where they populated the coastline of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, or the Viking period in the early Middle Ages, where Scandinavians raided throughout Europe and settled in Britain, Gaul, Ireland, and also in the East. 
However, rather than taking sea routes, these proto-Celts largely focused on spreading throughout Western Europe, at least during the Bronze Age. It was towards the end of the Tumulus culture that the first known massive battle took place in northwestern Europe, on the banks of the Tolenza River, on the boundary between the Tumulus, Nordic, and Lusatian cultures. It's estimated that approximately 4,000 well-armed warriors took part in the battle. Dozens of bodies have been excavated and hundreds more are suspected. Some of these warriors were decked out in full bronze plate armor. This was gear that was the equal of Greek Mycenaean warriors of the same time and took place at about the same time as the downfall of the Mycenaeans and other Mediterranean societies. It was likely a period of intense migration. Sudden climate change may have put pressure on various groups and droughts likely caused the downfall of the Mycenaeans. Well before the modern period, the climate was rapidly changing, sometimes leading to enormous Europe-wide catastrophes such as multi-year-long droughts, mass starvations, plagues, floods, etc. But also to times of immense boon and population explosions that would later cause their own unique difficulties. Emerging from the tumulus culture was the powerful and dynamic Urnfield culture. What the tumulus culture set in motion, the Urnfield culture would complete. The domination of Western Europe. The Urnfield culture from about 1300 BC was the first truly proto-Celtic cultural group. Although others beyond their range, such as those in Britain and Ireland, had been influenced by the Italo-Celtic of the Tumulus, perhaps causing their language to follow the flow of linguistic development in the mainland to some degree, the Urnfield culture is the group that actually established proto-Celtic as such though it had likely been present to varying degrees in different groupings, different tribal associations and communities for a while before the onset of the Urnfield culture. They expanded upon existing tumulus cultural groups, set up extensive trade networks, and continued the mass practice of sending warrior bands to seize territory. These bands began to enter Britain, and probably from there to Ireland, and though the timing of this cannot be known with strict certainty, it likely took place before 1000 BC, and this time frame would account for the language divergences not only between Insular and Continental Celtic, but between P and Q Celtic, uh, Goidelic and Brythonic. Just as the Saxons would do more than a thousand years later, the Celts came in relatively small numbers but established themselves as rulers, shifting the language and the religion to reflect their views. However, the local population of Indo-European peoples spoke a VSO language, likely influenced by the non-Indo-European language that preceded them when they first settled at the end of the Neolithic. This native but unknown Indo-European language then influenced the small number of ruling elites, and though the language shifted to a fully Celtic lexicon, it retained some of the former word order and a few other particularities. These Urnfield Celts expanded also into Spain sometime after 1300 BC. There had been a Bronze Age Atlantic trade network between Iberia, Ireland, and Britain, and it is possible that the Urnfield Celts followed these exact trade routes to their source, taking over each society, which was wealthy in mineral resources. Likely later excursions and familial connections between Celts in Iberia and Ireland form the basis of later medieval myth of the Milesians. The Urnfield culture is known and named for the specific burial practice of cremation, with a subsequent burial of the remains within an urn. This practice replaced the earlier tumuli, but its adoption across territory controlled by proto-Celtic speakers was not likely universal. 
The specific gods and religious traditions, such as Druids, would have traveled with the elite and established itself there, though likely many of the gods would have altered their names due to assimilation to local deities. Yet we see that the Gaels retained Danu as the mother of the gods, almost certainly due to their previous homeland along the Danube River. They then ascribe myths of this mother goddess to local river goddesses instead, such as Boyne, who is also known as Ethlu and various other names, likely all traces of assimilation to local goddesses of this non-Celtic but Indo-European beaker folk who had preceded them. Thus, the introduction of the Celtic language and elements of Celtic religion were the result of later Bronze Age warrior expansion from the Urnfield cultural group into an already existing Indo-European society as well as sustained contact with and likely further influxes from the continent, especially into Britain during the Iron Age. Thus, the original theory proposed for Celtic expansion is largely correct, save for this expansion first occurred towards the end of the Continental Bronze Age, not in the Mid-Iron Age. For a parallel example of the spread of language, and elements of religion without a massive influx of population, we can look at the Hittite culture and other Anatolian Indo-European speakers who only had a very small admixture of Indo-European. Even Greece itself was not nearly as heavily Indo-Europeanized as much of Europe, with various deities uh, retaining non-Indo-European names though the language, culture, religious practice, and many of the myths shifted over to a largely Indo-European form. In the Celtic example, this becomes facilitated by the fact that the groups they were conquering were already of the same origin. In our next video, we will look at the finer details of the Tumulus and Urnfield cultures, looking at specific artifacts and possible religious beliefs. If you like this video, please subscribe, like, and join us on Patreon. Gurvmila Magat Asaishjak Agus Marigoni Shas Gohard.